Welcome to this unit of the Sustainable Futures course. I'm Derek Rain from the Centre for Interdisciplinary Science at the University of Leicester, and I'm going to be your guide through this unit on the politics of poverty. So what we're going to talk about is uh, the problem of poverty and uh, poverty traps, income inequality in the first part of this unit. And then we'll look at uh, why some countries are rich, the history of uh, growth of the world economy. And then we'll look at the converse, why some countries are poor and why growth has been localised. And then finally, we'll go on to look at the history of development, how to spread growth to uh, encompass the whole population of the world, and briefly, the issues that that raises for sustainability. So let's look at the first section of the politics of poverty and where politics comes into the discussion. So we can think of the issues of sustainable development as dividing into three subsections, social aspects, economic aspects, and environmental aspects. We call these the dimensions of sustainability. Um, social aspects have to do with equity, uh, justice, um, social mobility, uh, education, and so on. Economic aspects, as you might expect, have to do with income, income inequality, uh, the access to basic standards of living, industrialization, development of agriculture, and so on. And the environment, of course, has to do with biodiversity, the impact of uh, the economic growth on the uh, ecology, on the sustainability of our environment. And these are in conflict. We can't have everything, even though we might want everything. And that's where politics comes in. Politics is about how to organize ourselves so that limited resources can be devolved, can be used in the most effective way. How we can come together to decide these issues and to make the most effective use for uh, the greatest benefit of society of the resources that we do have. So, in order to discuss the politics of poverty, let's begin with what we mean by absolute poverty. And to do this, I want to look at uh, what we call the gross domestic product. That's a measure of the goods and services produced in a country. Slightly diff different from the income of a country, because a country might earn some of its income from abroad, from remissions, from uh, people who've gone abroad and so on. Um, but its gross domestic product is some sort of measure of how well an economy is doing. Now, the slight complications, we just add up everything that's produced in a country. Um, if we want to compare countries, the complications arise from trying to make that comparison. Um, let me illustrate the point uh, by perhaps if you want to go and get your hair done, if you want a haircut uh, in America, it's actually rather expensive. If you want a haircut uh, in a developing country in, in Africa, it will cost something less. So you get the same goods and services for different numbers of dollars or different numbers of local currency. And in comparing standards of living, we have to take that into account. So to take that into account, we scale the income of a country to a, a standard international um, level, and we call this purchasing power parity. 
so that when we talk about the gross domestic product of a country, we talk about it in terms of how much it would buy if you were a citizen of the uh, United States. There's one other complication um, that the amount uh, that a given amount of currency will buy changes with time due to inflation. So uh, earnings increase not because they buy more but because the value of money might decrease. That's inflation. And so in comparing gross domestic product, in comparing the wealth of a country or of the world over time, we have to take account of the changing amounts that money will buy at different times in history. And so we have to adjust for inflation. And so we measure wealth in terms of uh, international dollars uh, purchasing power parity uh, at 1990 um, values or some equivalent. So given this um, introduction, given these definitions, what's the definition of absolute poverty? The World Bank uh, uses a definition of one and a quarter dollars per day per person. So that um, that's a number that has changed uh, with time. Um, you'll see if you uh, read uh, some of the literature on this that it used to be very conveniently a dollar a day. Um, you'll also see numbers like two and three dollars a day mentioned as levels below which people are absolutely poor in the sense that they can just survive. If you look at countries, the uh, gross domestic product of a country, um, the uh, least developed countries, the low income countries, um, usually it's somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 um, per year per person is the level at which countries are considered to be absolutely poor. And again, you'll see that figure is slightly different uh, depending upon um, who is doing the presentation. The, that's a very crude definition of poverty. Um, a more socially centred definition focuses on human rights. So uh, the UN definition of absolute poverty is um, that uh, one should have, uh, or that one falls below the basic human needs so that people who are absolutely poor fall below the level of providing sufficient food, sufficient access to health care, uh, sufficient uh, education, so that they can at least participate in society. Um, so uh, that's a more socially focused definition of absolute poverty. So now, what is the problem? Um, you'll see this developed in, in various ways, uh, but I've just uh, put a few numbers on the, on the slide here just to show um, where the issue is. So if we look at the rich world, um, the income, the gross domestic product, the amount that's produced per person uh, per year is, um, by definition of what uh, we mean by the rich world, um, $35,000 a year or more. Um, if we just take one example, and I've taken Israel here, the uh, gross domestic product per person is $25,000. So Israel falls just below the um, high income countries. It's sort of the top of the middle income countries. So now suppose we just took $10,000 per year from everyone in a high income country. That's one billion people, and distributed it um, around the rest of the world so that everyone had the, or we tempted to give everyone the, uh, the income of, of Israel, of an Israeli citizen. That would give us something like $10 trillion um, dollars available. And then we can see what we could do with that. To bring um, the bottom billion people in the world, that's those people who are earning 
less than one and a quarter dollars per person per day. To bring those up to the world average, not to the low income average, but just to the world average, would require something like $7 trillion. So we could just about do that. Um, on the other hand, if we wanted to make the whole world, um, bring the whole world up to the level of, let's say, Israel, then that will require $18 trillion, a transfer of that much every year. Now, not only is that politically impossible, it's also economically uh, impossible because you can't take that amount away from the rich world and expect the rich world to remain rich. Um, and if we wanted to bring the whole world up to uh, $25,000, dollars per person per year, we'd need 25, a transfer of $25 trillion, which just is not available. So we have to consider what are the priorities, what can we do, what is politically and economically feasible, and that's where politics uh, comes in. We have to decide what is possible, what we want, and whether there are routes to getting from where we are to where we want to be. And sustainability comes in because we also have to look at what the planet can give us, what the planet can accommodate, planetary boundaries, resource issues, how much can we extract from the environment uh, in order to fulfil these desires and how can we do that sustainably. Now, just to give you some idea that there is some progress, um, let's look at the way the number of people living in absolute poverty has changed from the uh, 1980s to um, 2008 on this slide. Um, if we look here at East Asia and the Pacific, what we see is a huge decline in the absolute number of people living under $1.25 a day. If we look at East and South Asia, there's been very little change there, although if you carry this graph on a little bit longer, then there's started to be a change there. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world, again, the number of people living in absolute poverty has actually gone up. So we are doing we're making progress in some areas of the world. Um, we're not making progress, or we haven't made much progress until very recently in other areas of the world. This slide shows where in the world we find uh, extreme poverty, where people are living on less than one and a quarter dollars per person per day. And you'll see a comparison here uh, between uh, 1995 on the left and 2005 on the, on the right. And what you see again here is China, that's East Asia, moving to the right here, which is an increase in um, uh, income per, per person and a decrease in the number of uh, people who are uh, living in extreme poverty. Um, India here uh, hasn't moved very much, but is now beginning to move um, a little bit. Um, there are African countries here like Tanzania, uh, which have, have scarcely moved at all. But Africa is not a homogeneous um, continent. Not everything is the same. Here you can see that uh, Ghana has made uh, some progress in moving down reducing the number of extreme poor and moving to the right, increasing uh, the number, uh, increasing their average GDP per person per year. Just to emphasize that Africa isn't one country, we can look at the development tracks of um, various countries of Africa over um, the uh, 20 years since, um, since 1980, uh, when the data was available for some of the uh, earliest uh, data on this graph. And what we see, um, if you look at those blue 
lines is um, very different uh, development tracks. What you see is uh, Mauritius here shooting up um, under very good governance uh, to become one of the um, richest countries in Africa. Um, we can see the, uh, um, uh, the Ghana here is making some progress, Cape Verde wandering all over the place. Um, uh, so there's a great variety of development trajectories, um, even within some of the uh, low-income countries, even within some of the poorer countries. This slide just reminds us um, what poverty looks like. One to two dollars a day is the bare minimum. You can see um, from the slide that people living in that in those conditions have um, very little, uh, very few possessions, uh, if any, really just the basics. Get slightly better as you move to the centre there on two to the five dollars a day, that uh, chap at the top's got somewhere to sit down, doesn't have to, to eat on the floor. Um, and once you get to 10 to 50 dollars a day, um, you start to be able to afford some of the conveniences of modern life. However, this is also what extreme poverty looks like. It's not uniform. There can be wealth alongside extreme poverty. The people today living in extreme poverty are not all living in the same place. So even within poor countries, there are uh, people who are um, wealthy and there are clearly structural reasons, political reasons, why um, you can have a, a photograph like this. So we don't have to, we don't have to look just at averages. We mustn't look just at averages. We must look at uh, distributions. And there, there is some progress. This is the income distribution of the world in uh, 1970. And what you see is there are essentially two humps. There's America, USA, uh, up the top there. Um, there's China and the world forming a hump around $1,000 per um, person per year in purchasing power parity in international dollars. Um, and you can see he India just hiding behind China there. That has changed. Um, if we move on to uh, 2000, you see that China is starting to catch up with the US. There is um, now an overlap between China and the states. And uh, you see that the number of really absolutely poor people in China has reduced enormously. Um, the, the tail of that, those distributions are really just in the rest of the world beyond China and, and India, the sub-Saharan Africa, um, other parts of Asia. So there is some um, progress there. Um, why is this important? Because we need to look at the effects of income inequality, not just the picture you saw of the Bengal famine, but the ongoing effects for everyone that lives in a grossly unequal society. And uh, what's plotted here is some index of the sort of problems uh, that people have against the uh, amount of income inequality. So we can measure how unequal societies are, and that's plotted along the uh, x-axis, along the horizontal axis there. And we can measure um, some index, some combination of problems of how long people expect to live, um, the uh, rates at which children die under the age of five, that's infant mortality, the number, the percentage of um, children uh, under the age of 10 that are actually in uh, education, and so on. Levels of trust in a, in a society can be measured uh, as well. And when you plot these, 
you find that however income inequality arises, and I'll say two words about that in a moment, the problems associated with inequality rise with that level of inequality. All of these problems are worse in more unequal societies. And it doesn't actually matter whether the societies are made more equal by redistribution through taxation or whether they are more equal before um, taxation. However you achieve equality, or however you achieve greater equality, uh, the societies are better off. So Japan has very limited social support, um, low levels of taxation, but a fairly equal distribution of incomes before taxation. Uh, the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland there, have uh, very unequal uh, pre-tax distribution of income, but everyone is taxed quite heavily, so income is redistributed and you have a very supportive social system, and either of those reduces uh, these problems. So we're not only trying to look at the political problems of raising the average income uh, of low-income countries, we're also looking at the problems of equal distribution. And finally, in this part of the talk, I want to say something about what's called the poverty trap. And this is a really important issue in development economics. What we have to imagine is a poor farmer who can only, say, afford limited amount of fertilizer or only poor quality seeds. He will not be able to generate a surplus for um, doing more than feeding his family. So he will not be able to generate um, an income that can add to his wealth each year. Um, he therefore is trapped in, um, uh, at a level of, of poverty and his position then is illustrated on the uh, left hand slide, left hand graph. That if you look uh, down the bottom of this um, slide you can see the trajectory of that um, farmer as he gets poorer year by year until, um, well, until he can't, can't get any poorer. So if income tomorrow plotted against income today has that S shape, uh, the S shape of the left hand curve, then there's a trap. If you're down the bottom, you can't get out. Uh, if you have the sort of curve on the right hand side, side usually called an inverted L, then you can get out of poverty because you buy a little bit more of good quality seed or a little bit more fertilizer, you make a little bit more surplus, that enables you to buy a little bit more fertilizer, you make yet more surplus, and you can get yourself out of poverty. So the question is, the issue is, if there is a poverty trap, then we have to provide some way out of uh, such a trap because people can't get themselves out of that trap. If there is no poverty trap, then uh, people simply need to be nudged in the right direction. Countries can get themselves out of uh, poverty. People can get themselves out of poverty. And this is a big issue in terms of how we should focus uh, development aid as to whether or not these traps exist. And there's a lot of research literature on this. So, what should be the target of poverty reduction? How can these targets be achieved sustainably? Uh, what do we want to do? Uh, what are the problems that are stopping us from doing it? In order to answer these sorts of questions, we really do have to go back and look at how the world developed, how rich countries got rich, and then why poor countries are poor. And that will do in the next section. <laughs>